three UN peacekeepers who've spent the past decade working in some of the world's hot spots, Cambodia, Somalia, Haiti, Rwanda, Liberia, and Bosnia, have written an expose that's left some UN officials rather hot under the collar. In emergency sex and other desperate measures, Andrew Thompson, Kenneth Kane, and Heidi Pusselwaite describe the wild parties, drinking, binges, drugs, and sexual encounters they enjoyed when they weren't busy saving lives or promoting fair elections. They also describe corruption and security problems with the UN's administration and these or, uh, of the, the projects that they're involved with, and they say that they have put workers' lives in danger. Publishers Weekly call the book infuriating, heart-wrenching, and well-written. It is published by Miramax, and I'm very pleased it has brought Andrew Thompson, Kenneth Kane, and Heidi Fossilway to my show today. Hello. So uh, this is the book the UN didn't want us to read. Considering what you reveal here, I doubt you were surprised by the reaction at the UN. Were you at all? Um, I wasn't. Uh, what I was surprised about was um, they seemed to be more interested in that we had published a book at all um, rather than the contents of the book. Yeah, that's exactly right. There's there's very little in the book that's um, news in in the sense of we know that 800,000 Tutsis were killed and the UN should have intervened and failed to. Bosnia was a moral catastrophe. Everyone knows that. In fact, um, even UN administrators have written books themselves to talk about that. Precisely the case. And so, um, you know, I think that they want to control what comes out of the UN. I, it, my personal opinion is that, you know, if they thought they could send out thousands of young idealistic workers into war zones and nobody would come back, you know, with an angry story to tell, um, they shouldn't be surprised. But aren't there rules? Uh, aren't they supposed to be able to vet any book published by one of their employees? That's right, and, and when we were informed of those rules, uh, Leonard, we requested permission, and we're really quite surprised when that permission was denied, uh, and that decision was taken at the highest levels of the organization by people in, in Mr. Anand's inner circle. Um, so we, we didn't get permission, although we asked for it. Do you still work at the UN, any of you? Andrew and I do. We're both there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I understand the UN comes down rather hard on people that uh, that they are upset by. Uh, the Canadian Andre Serrois reported mismanagement in Rwanda and was fired, although everything that he claimed turned out to be true. Andrew? I think it's true that um, the UN works slowly and, and some of the things we've written about may be accepted as time goes by once the, um, the headlines of um, scandal have passed. Um, what really concerns us is the content of the book and, and these are eyewitness accounts of of a very dark decade of UN peacekeeping. We were there on the front lines and, and we've written about what we saw. Do you think that uh, they just particularly sent they've received over the investigation uh, that's being launched into corruption allegations, 65 billion dollars oil for food program that uh, Saddam Hussein seemed to benefit from mostly? Yeah, that's certainly one of the reasons why they're upset, but our answer to that is when is a good time to publish a book um, about UN scandals? There seems to be one every six months, and our response is it isn't our fault that the things that we're talking about, which we witnessed in the field, um, happens to be published when there's half a dozen other scandals at the UN. You know, they should get their act together. The problem isn't the messenger. Let's talk about how you all met in Phnom Penh. Andrew, you were there first, weren't you? Uh, Leonard, I was there working with the Red Cross uh, a couple of years before Ken and Heidi arrived. I was doing um, medical work in, in the war zone. The war was ongoing there. The Khmer Rouge uh, hadn't um, come in from the jungle. So I was there for two years before the big peacekeeping mission arrived. And you, were, you had gone there from New Zealand? I had. I, I grew up in a missionary family. and. I guess I inherited from my parents an ideal of service and, and when I graduated from med school in Auckland it seemed to me that I could serve more effectively in Cambodia where there'd been a genocide and, and there was an ongoing war than I could in Auckland so I arrived there as a very young doctor. And Ken, you were a corporate lawyer, weren't you? Well, um, that was one of my alternatives. I chose not to sit in an office with a man in a yellow polka-dotted tie telling me what to do. <laughs> and instead, I wound up with Andrew telling me what to do in Cambodia. Andrew was an old hand, and in these war zones, you need old hands around you. Heidi, uh, your reasons were less altruistic. Well, I don't know. I was working as a social worker down on the Bowery, which is pretty altruistic. Um, I was making almost no money at all, and I was going through a separation. 
um, from my ex-husband. And I just really couldn't survive in New York City on the money I was making as a social worker. So, I, you know, the UN was a good option for me. And you found yourself thrown together in Phnom Penh. Did you take to each other from the start? Um, it's a funny story. Yeah. I met Ken first, and I didn't like him at all. And I didn't like Heidi. <laughs> I wasn't sure about Heidi or Ken, and they weren't sure about me. Well, no. they knew you by reputation, <laughs> mostly, Andrew, didn't they? Yeah. Andrew was a legend already. Um, I didn't like Ken simply because I thought that he represented something, you know, Ivy League and... I, Harvard. You didn't like the word Harvard. Yeah, say I didn't. It. <laughs> say it. She has a prejudice. <laughs> what was funny in Cambodia is that, you know, you're jammed together. Um, you don't know anybody. You come in alone, um, and you're looking for friends. It's a horrible context. People are dying around you. Um, you're scared. Um, and so kind of weird friendships and weird kind of groups um, form, and, and ours did. It's kind of like you watch in MASH or, you know, China Beach, but it was our lives in this case. And, Andrew, you were, as you said, working for the Red Cross. So how did you wind up with the UN? Um, I'd worked there for two years, and it just seemed to me that the war was going on and on. There were peace conferences, but nothing ever came of it. And, and the promise of this large uh, UN mission arriving there right at the end of the Cold War was very heady. Uh, $2 billion, 20,000 peacekeepers, the whole world wanting this Cambodian situation to be resolved and to have peace. And I signed on to that thinking that if peace was made, there would be fewer legs to amputate. But it did take you away from practicing medicine, didn't it? Uh, it made, uh, made me more general in my practice of medicine. I was actually hired to work in the Phnom Penh prisons, which were Soviet-style dungeons, and, and prisoners were dying. And the UN wasn't quite sure why. So I signed on to do medical work for the UN. Most of the attention to this book has been paid to some of the wilder things, but let's talk about some of the, the serious things you report here. Uh, you reveal some unflattering things about how the UN conducted these peacekeeping missions. Did the UN really hire Bulgarian peacekeepers who'd been freed from prison in order to serve? Yes, sir, they did. Um, the, the UN doesn't actually hire troops. It's a deal between the member states, so the Bulgarian government sends the troops that it sends. It's not exactly the UN's fault. Um, and the UN then accepts wh whomever they, you know, they receive. Um, it, the problem is that in, in this particular case, that this is right at the end of the Cold War, Bulgaria was a mess. Um, they had no idea how a peacekeeping mission actually operates, and they ended up um, sending a battalion of very unprofessional soldiers, including um, criminals, and these criminals conducted themselves like criminals. They were drunk, they were crashing their cars, fighting over women, exchanges with the Khmer Rouge over brothels. Um, it was a big mess. So the UN then has to do some peacekeeping about their own peacekeepers. Yeah, precisely. And this goes on. This continues. You know, if you read the paper, you'll see a scandal every few months about a contingent that's out of control in Angola or in Mozambique or in Kosovo. Um, the UN does not police itself well at all. And Heidi, think, yeah, go ahead. I think the reason that we put that in the book, Leonard, was not so much that, that it occurred, but that those several hundred Bulgarian soldiers were really bringing shame on, on the 20,000 other people who were working very hard to run an election. And, and secondly, they were supposed to be in charge of security in their areas, and, and they weren't. They were busy acting like Ken said they acted. That put our lives in more danger, and it also put the lives of the Cambodians who were voting in, in more danger. So not only did they behave badly, but they, they made things worse. And, and we put it in there to contrast with, with the other people who were working incredibly hard. So what do you do? Uh, who, does somebody then call you in headquarters and say, get these Bulgarians out of here? <laughs> I think in fairness to, to the UN, many of them were sent home, but it's a slow process. Uh, yeah. One of the issues um, that we write about and I think that we think is very important, the UN has a tendency to save face rather than save lives. It's, they're very slow and reluctant to admit a problem, address it, um, and fix it. And you know that's to everyone's detriment. Heidi, when you worked in Somalia, you were worried about security. Why were you so concerned? Um, we were living in a compound that was protected by some UN peacekeepers. Uh, we had some peacekeepers at the gate. Anything could have happened. Uh, we would go to bed at night, and there would be mortar rounds that would come in, sometimes two or three times a night. But traveling on the roads was particularly dangerous. 
there was a convoy that went from, it, it was maybe only a 10 minute drive if you went straight through the village and to the compound. Um, but we often couldn't take that and would have to circle around on a perimeter road that the Americans built. And that would take about an hour. It was just kind of haphazard. Um, the convoy was probably 20 vehicles long and the front didn't know what the back was doing and vice versa. We had um, Somali gunmen interspersed in the, in the convoys and they would sometimes overreact and just fire into the air. And so, so, so it was just a, it was a, a terrible way to start your day. <laughs> and then an American colleague got killed when his UN vehicle was ambushed. Right. That and was, you, you suggest that that could have been avoided. Yeah, that was a convoy that I drove in regularly. It was, um, I, I, I did a different job. Um, we had different hours in the office I worked in, and we had to leave earlier, and we came back to the, to the residences later. Um, and so this was a convoy. It was just one vehicle with one Somali car following us that had three or four shooters in it. We called them shooters. Um, Bodyguards are called shooters? Well, they weren't bodyguards. They were literally shooters. <laughs> they, they carried weapons and they shot and them they shot. <laughs> um, if there was any kind of threat. And I, things were done in, in, in the vehicle. There were only three of us that were in this office that drove with the security guard um, in, this, in this early morning convoy. And he would drive very fast and he would lose the Somali car behind us. So we were pretty much unprotected. But the worst thing, he, he would take roads that we were that were closed to UN traffic. Um, he, he just didn't pay attention to any of the security procedures. But one of the worst things he did was he would give an AK-47 to one of my colleagues, the one who was killed. Um, and he would sit in the back seat next to me with an AK-47 hanging out the window. I don't, if, if he, I don't think that he had any um, knowledge of weapons. But and that was a provocation. Yeah, and this is what happened. I, I decided I wasn't going to drive in this convoy anymore, and I um, moved into the embassy compound where we were working. And about a month later, they were ambushed on the way to work. Um, the other three people, including the security officers, stepped out of the vehicle, put their hands up, were just going to let them take the car. And um, he panicked and opened fire, and there were four Somalis with, with guns who were, who were ambushing the car. Um, and so I firmly believe that that wouldn't have happened if security procedures had been followed. Didn't you also work with a UN official who demanded that employees give them a percentage of their salaries? That yeah. was actually Ken. Yeah. <laughs> Kickbacks well, we all the UN? Near him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's a story from Somalia where we were trying to set up a judicial system. Um, it's actually a little bit scarily analogous to some of what we're trying to do in Iraq right now. Um, you know, it was chaos. It was a civil war. There was no government really to work with, and yet we were trying to set up courts. And we see what's happened to Somalia. It's still chaos. It's, yeah, it's whatever. 12, 13 years later, it hasn't taken a single step forward. Um, I don't think those courts are functioning yet. And one of the officials that I was working with who was responsible for hiring Somali judges, um, it turned out, um, actually, I figured this out in the middle of a firefight. One of the judges turned to me and said, do you know why your boss, the guy who was in charge of hiring the Somali judges, has been so anxious to get this court functioning? And I said, well, of course, it's human rights. I was very young and very naive. It's, you know, it's human rights. It's peacemaking. This is what the UN does. And he said, no, no, no. He actually pulled the pockets out, you know, the lining of his pockets and said, no, no, no. We have to give him 15% of our salaries. Wow. So... But but that's not surprising, is it? Uh, even in the most idealistic organization, there are always some people who are corrupt, aren't there? Would the UN be any different than any place else? No, I, I mean, there was also talk about some people involved in the UN right. uh, it, demanding sexual favors from people they were supposedly protecting. Uh, it's sad, but it's not surprising, is it? I think the, <clears throat> the difference with the UN is that so many of these um, events or people who behave like that are not pursued. Many of them just leave the mission and that's the end of the story. There are rare cases where people are, are criminally pursued, but I think it's the exception rather than the rule. And that's because the UN just wants to protect its image? Yes. Does it feel so under attack? I think that that's right. Take a look at the difference between what's happened in Abu Ghraib versus some of these UN scandals. We have five, six congressional committees investigating Abu Ghraib. Just today, the Pentagon has announced it's going to... Um, call in very, very senior commanders. There's a judicial process at work. 
Um, there's accountability in the U.S. Everybody makes mistakes. As you said, bureaucracies are laden with corruption all over the planet. The difference is that there's no accountability at the U.N. You can count on your hand the amount of people who've actually been prosecuted or disciplined. The irony here is the U.N. has threatened to discipline Andrew and Heidi for writing a book, but there's $10 billion missing in Iraq. Who's Who's been disciplined? And is there no uh, internal procedure to correct that? I think it's very slow. I think it's under financed. It, it really doesn't work, I think. One of the things that um, my last two missions were working for the UN war crimes tribunals, one for Bosnia and one for the genocide in Rwanda. And I was in charge of exhumations in those countries, and you can read about that in, in the back half of the book. One of the reasons those tribunals work is that they establish individual accountability for these crimes. So not every Serb in Serbia is guilty of what went on in Bosnia. Not every Rwandan Hutu is guilty of, of being involved in that genocide. Um, so there's individual accountability there. This is what we don't see at the UN. Um, at a certain point, I have the impression anyway that, that if you get high enough or you're well enough protected, you, you're kind of in a safe haven of your own away from any accountability. We will take a little break here, and when we come back, we'll find out what this title of this book means, Emergency Sex and Other Desperate Measures, A True Story from Hell on Earth. My guests are Kenneth Kane, Heidi Postlewaite, and Andrew Thompson. Their book is published by Miramax. Stay with us. I'm Leonard Lopate, and this is WNYC 93.9 AMA 20. We're online at WNYC.org. My guests are Kenneth Kane, who is writing these days. In fact, he's written for the New York Times, Times Magazine, uh, Human Rights Quarterly, uh, former UN peacekeeper. Heidi Postlewaite still works for the UN in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. And Andrew Thompson divides his time between New York, where he works as a medical officer at the UN headquarters, and Cambodia, where he's building a house beside the Mekong River. Uh, they've written a book called Together, called Emergency Sex and Other Desperate Measures, A True Story from Hell on Earth. It's published by Miramax. And let's talk about that title for a moment. Uh, Heidi, this comes out of something that happened with you. I did. Um, it's funny, the woman always has to talk about sex, right? Well, <laughs> well you, you're the one who supplied the title. <laughs> we're here, we're ready. Um, the title refers to one of the stories. Um, I was with a colleague of mine, and um, we were on our way to dinner one night in the compound in Mogadishu, and we were suddenly, there was sniper fire. There was a sniper across the road who was shooting at us, and, um, you know, you, it's 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 such an intense feeling. It's like having poison in your body. All that adrenaline and fear, um, things happen to you that you can't even imagine. And what do you do with all that when it's over, when a few minutes later you're safe and you're just standing there and nobody else has seen it, you have nobody else to share this with? Um, I think that emergency sex is kind of a metaphor for all those emotions, the intensity of living in war, um, of, you know, being scared out of your mind. And people sometimes, when they are deathly afraid, do things like have sex because uh, it almost feels like it's a way of reminding themselves that they're human. Also, right. it's an antidote. We may die in 10 seconds anyway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Andrew, uh, you blew off some of your attention windsurfing, did you? Is uh, Why didn't you call the book Emergency Windsurfing? <laughs> <another desperate measure? laughs> That's a good question, then. I did... Uh, when I had time off in Cambodia, windsurf on the Mekong River, and uh, it had an edge of danger to it. I was never really sure whether I'd be shot at from the far bank, where there was still Khmer Rouge uh, uh, lurking. Um, but yes, that was one of my ways to blow off steam. And the partying that you describe in this book, is that another way, after having spent a whole day under the most tense situations? Yeah, that's exactly right. I, my version of it is that everything in a war is magnified. Friendship is magnified. That's a big part of how and why we wrote the book. 
Um, your anger is magnified. You know, if your boss is putting you in danger and you think that that's due to corruption, you, you're ready to kill your boss with your bare hands. Um, another thing that's magnified is kind of revelry. You want to celebrate life. You want to go to the top of a, you know, the roof and scream out that you want to stay alive. And that's sex and that's drinking and that's, you know, revelry, sure. So when you had parties, uh, the hippest parties in town, I, I hear, <laughs> uh, did, who came <laughs> other than other UN peacekeepers? Everybody. We had Peace Corps people there, other NGOs. Um, everybody journalists. came. Yeah, Even journalists. journalists? You had oh, journalists yeah. in your party? Oh, yeah. A lot of journalists. Was in your house the, the, uh, the most desirable place in town to live as well? As a matter of fact, we used to close the gates on Sunday, and we would call it a family day. And only a few people outside of the house were invited. There were about 10 of us that lived together there. And uh, we would spend the day up on the roof. Somebody brought back from Bangkok these little blow-up kiddie pools. And we would just lie up there drinking mango daiquiris and swimming in the kiddie pools. What was the space shuttle hour? That's a legendary uh, drink, uh, Leonard. And uh, I'm devastated. I think the recipe has been lost in, in <laughs> history. Um, but, uh, yes, you know, I remember those parties as being very mellow. I didn't live in the, the house with... Uh, Heidi and Ken, but I remember just a feeling of we were surrounded by violence day after day, and to come into that haven uh, where everyone tolerated everyone else, where ten languages were spoken, it was it was almost the opposite of all the violence that we saw on the outside. The other important thing to mention here, I think, is that in this part of the book, it's right at the end of the Cold War, and that was a very giddy time. You remember the images from Berlin. This was our version of it, that we were going to make peace all over the world. This was the first chapter. But it wasn't my sense that Cambodia was particularly dangerous at this time, except for uh, the, the the forests where the Khmer Rouge still had little outposts. Uh, you were in Phnom Penh. Looking back on it, um, given what we saw afterwards and the violence of those situations in Somalia and Haiti and, and Bosnia and Rwanda, Liberia, it it was fairly safe. But at the time, 10,000 Khmer Rouge troops had threatened to attack the election, uh, and it was a very real threat. They were mobilizing to attack the civilians out on the front lines. Heidi has a story about that, how terrifying it was to be out there as a civilian just waiting for those guys to turn up. Yeah, we were also very young then and very inexperienced. Um, and there was a very, very young a UN volunteer who was killed, ambushed by the Khmer Rouge and killed. Um, so when you have no experience of violence, um, a little bit is enough. Do friendships develop between uh, people like you and the locals? Or it, is the, the fact that the friendships become so intense between the three of you because you had to hold yourself apart from the local people? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's both. Um, but for myself, I still have friends in all the countries that I, I was in, very close friends. Um, that was a really a, an important part of the experience for me, to be more immersed in the culture and to find out what those people were going through. Um, that you know, it wasn't just a UN party. Now you you were in a lot of dangerous situations. Why so many? Was there an adrenaline rush going on here, or or you just I, I Foolhardy. Think, no, I think that there's an addiction to it, to to the whole way of life. Um, you know, you, you come home here and you, you just want to buy shampoo, and there are 400 brands there. It's just, it's overwhelming. There's just so much here. So so you're you're living... Well, so how many shampoos can you buy? In <laughs> None, that's right. <laughs> None. You wash your hair with soap. Um, so, so life is just simpler out there. Um, and people are closer. You nobody is there with their families or friends, non-UN friends. Um, things just happen differently there. Again, I think emergency sex as a title is a metaphor for something important, which is, and I think that New Yorkers experienced this after 9/11. When there's tension and when there's violence and when death is close, the borders between people, the walls between people, crumble. And there's a, an immediate intimacy with your friends and with the locals that you get to know um, that's, you know, that's quite invigorating and quite addictive. Did you find that you needed the poor and sick people you worked with as much as they needed you? Mm. I think that's a really fair question, Leonard. One of my conclusions at the end of the book, actually, is that Heidi, um, who I thought really didn't know much about humanitarian work when I met her in, in Cambodia, actually had it all figured out because of her work on the Bowery and that each of my missions is really just an attempt to make 
that mission and what I saw on the ground conformed to my ideals and that worked in Cambodia and then it just blew apart in Haiti and, and the mass graves of Rwanda and, and the graves of Srebrenica so I think that uh, that's a good question. I don't have an answer to it. It blew apart because they didn't turn out the way you wanted or because there's also a certain kind of cultural expectation that doesn't always pan out? I think that I could never have imagined when I joined UN Peacekeeping in the early 90s with that euphoria that Ken and Heidi have described that, that it would end up with our peacekeepers walking away from two genocides. I'm talking about Rwanda and, mm. and Srebrenica. And... Um, I just kept going until it was obvious that I think my ideals had died. And we've had more because just recently in the Congo we had another case where the UN just gave up a city to a, a rebel group. And although that city has, I think, been taken back, it's still the UN uh, has made a habit of doing this, hasn't it? Promising people they'll protect them and then not coming through? Yeah, that last part of your point is the most important one. There are explicit and implicit promises when, when UN boots land on the ground that the UN, I'm afraid, doesn't think through clearly enough. Uh, the safe havens in Bosnia are the classic example. Now, many people have blamed that on the fact that the UN is made up of so many competing nations who that have their own foreign policy agendas. And so the, the French and the Americans and the Germans may have different ideas of what should be done in a, a specific situation, and the soldiers and the peacekeepers are caught in the middle. The model that seems to work is if there is one um, force that has potency uh, that goes in with uh, a UN cover for political legitimacy. It worked with the British in Sierra Leone, it worked with the Australians in Timor, and it worked with NATO in Kosovo. Um, there is a mix of uh, of force and UN political legitimacy that can work. But in Rwanda there were people who had different ideas as to whether to support the Hutus and the Tutsis and uh, the UN gets caught in that, doesn't it? What happens to the peacekeepers? Do they get mixed messages from headquarters? In, in fairness to those peacekeepers, then they got the order from New York to evacuate and there was one courageous general on the ground, a Canadian general, Delaire, who more or less disobeyed orders and kept two or three hundred troops there but then was just overwhelmed with, with the killing that was going on around him. I think I've stood on the edge of those graves month after month during exhumations and you look at the survivors, they come and they look for their loved ones. What do you say to them? That, that it was the peacekeepers or was it the US or, or the French? It, it, there's no real answer to that. And then there were uh, how many? 8,000 Muslims um, killed in Srebrenica, another safe haven? That's right. They, and, and they were there because the UN had promised them protection and when the Bosnian Serbs uh, called the UN's bluff and the US's bluff, uh, they were abandoned to their death. So is the UN just a waste of time when it comes to these peacekeeping missions? And there's the 64. How many billions of dollars are missing in Iraq? $10 billion question. No, it's not a waste of time. Again, there is, I think, you know, this era isn't all that old. This is the post-Cold War era is when we started experimenting with this version of UN force. And I think eventually we'll get to a mix between U.S. force and, and legitimacy from the UN. How did your families react to your announcement that you were going to work in these dangerous situations? Hmm. Were they, uh, did they all tell you not to do it? Heidi? I, you know, for myself, I think that my parents were very excited about it. They um, were very proud that I was working for the UN. And, you know, my parents married and had children very young. They're only 20 years old. Um, I think that they lived vicariously through me. Now that they've read the book, are they still living vicariously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, my dad always says, can I slip into your suitcase every time I go off on a trip? But there, there are some embarrassing things in this book. Um, do family members are all, have all your families read these? I, I was very nervous when I gave the final manuscript to my mum and dad, and uh, they read through it from cover to cover. Normally, they go to bed early, so they sat up till one or two in the morning. And my mother gave me a big hug and said, "I love the title, and, and we're glad that you did all that work." Are they? I think they're my first fans. Mm. Mm -hmm. My parents are both psychologists, so I think they hear as bad or worse in their office every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it still um, is really about uh, a situation that continues. These are very serious situations that you're talking about. The blowing off steam is just the colorful part. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for being with us. Kenneth Kane, Heidi Postlewaite, and Andrew Thompson. The book, Emergency Sex and Other Desperate Measures, a true story from hell on earth, or actually we should say many hells. On Earth. It's published by Merrimax. It's been a great pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Lenny.